So to start, I have to say, I'm going to use this guy, this intense looking Indian tobacco seller, as a spokesman for mysticism, because his book is the book that explains these principles the most clearly without all the religious baggage. And uh, he really just gets to the core. The same things that he says have been said, you can find them in the Buddhist sutras, you'll find them in Taoist texts. They're just the fundamentals of what mysticism is about. So what is that? Well, the core components of mysticism, the first one, all elements of the world are defined by and in turn, they define all the other elements, kind of a circular thing. Nizagadatta says, and this little IAT means I am that, that's where I got nearly all of the quotes from. Um, no thing in existence has a particular cause. The entire universe contributes to the existence of even the smallest thing. Nothing can be as it is without the universe being what it is. And this slide, which you might recognize from uh, Shantena's talk, which is kind of funny because I picked it randomly out of a Google Images a few weeks ago, and he, I talked to him after his talk, and he said he never used this before, but you know, it, for me it means we're on the same track. And also, there's several other slides that he used as well in my talk, it's kind of strange. Um, but what this, what this image conveys is the fact that uh, the phenomenal world is self-defining, it's circular. Everything defines everything else because fundamentally it is coming from interactions. What are real, uh, interactions are much more real than the objects that are supposedly interacting, which kind of sounds weird, but it really does seem to be true. <clears throat> so all things, phenomenal things, objects, substances. What is a substance? What is a substance in itself? Substances are defined by their properties, if you look in the dictionary. And a property is just a list of characteristic interactions with other substances. You never know what a substance is in itself. You know how it interacts with all the other substances that are defined together. So like in a dictionary, like we go to a dictionary to find, to find meaning, but there's no meaning in a dictionary because all the words are defined by all the other words. You can't find meaning in a dictionary unless you've had direct experience of one of the words. You see some blood and someone says to you, blood red, 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 red. You look at it a lot of times, you know what red is because you have a direct experience of it. And then relative to that, you can know what the, the meaning of all the other words is. Phenomenal reality is like that. It's kind of empty in itself. If there was no experience, if there's no direct experience of things, the universe will be completely empty. It's completely circular. It's all defining itself. Another image that Shantani used, that this is Indra's net. Indra's net, the idea is that you have something, some reflection point, a jewel originally. The jewel reflects all the other jewels. And uh, that reflects how everything's related to everything else. And the important point is that there isn't actually any jewels. The jewels aren't there. There's just a perspective, a relative point, which everything else is defined to. And everything is nothing but the reflection of all the other points, it's completely circular, and it's, uh, there's no material substance to it. So the essence of each element is nothing material, only the perspective that you have. So the problem with uh, getting with a perspective is, a perspective comes from identifying with some part of reality. If I identify with this body, with this mind, I have a perspective now. And everything in my universe is defined relative to this perspective. And that's the problem. As uh, Nizagadatta says, you are universal. Only cease imagining yourself to be the particular. And you can only identify with a part of the whole if you believe that the part really is separate from the whole. And again, he says, all divisions are illusory. The division is in the mind, there's none in reality. When we think about that, it just comes from the first statement, everything defines everything else. So the summary is the universe is not separate objects that exist independently from us. Now I'm gonna talk about observer dependent independence in physics. So in quantum physics, one of the principles, uh, mysticism, this non-locality, the fact that, that there are no real separate objects is actually getting pretty close, it's accepted by 
um, quite a number of physicists now, the fact that things are non-local. And that's because there's been a lot of experiments. You may have heard of um, Bell's theorem, entanglement. They've done the experiments so many times that all the loopholes that people say, there's so many loopholes, they finally got rid of all the loopholes, and now it's accepted by a lot of physicists that actually quantum reality at the quantum level is non-local, which means that it's not due to just interactions of one thing next to another thing, determining what actually happens. If you think what happens in um, quantum field theory, which is kind of the evolution of quantum field theory, is what physicists use kind of the next generation of quantum physics. It deals with fields. And fields, the, the kind of ontological reality, what a field is, if fields are present, there's no dividing line in a field. It's present everywhere and at all times. So this non-locality thing, physicists are kind of down with that. But when it comes to the idea that the objective existence of the physical world is independent of observation, this is an idea that physicists really want to hold on to. Kind of this idea that observation has any role in physics, they really hate that. Okay, so now to look at that, we'll look at um, the double slit experiment, which again, Santana talked about, so I hope I don't have to say too much about it. Looking from the top, if you have some uh, light coming in and it gets, gets diffracted by these slits, you get this weird interference. And it's weird because if you send in a single photon, a single photon of light, you still get this interference, even though it's got two slits. So how does a single photon go through both slits? The idea that they propose is, oh, the photon's a wave. It's a wave, so it can, in some way, interact with itself, produce an interference pattern. So they also don't experiment. So actually, I really want to know what slit did it really go through? Where did, sorry guys, I'm kind of facing this way a bit. What, what slit did the, did the photon actually go through? And you can put the detector and say, oh, and now I know what slit it went through. And if you do that, the interference goes away. It's kind of weird. So what would happen if you take away the information about which slit it went through? And that's called the uh, quantum eraser experiment. In this experiment, you, uh, this is equivalent to the double slit, okay? So you shine in some light here. And this diagonal line is called a beam splitter. The beam splitter, 50%, half the light goes through here. Half the light gets reflected and goes down here. You put in a phase shifter, which kind of moves the light a bit. Then you can get it to interfere with itself. And when you combine them together again with another beam splitter, you can see interference fringes. If you do the equivalent of measuring which slit it went through, which is you put in something here, it doesn't matter what it's a, it's a barium borate crystal, which takes light. When a photon goes in, it makes a copy of that photon. It creates an, another entangled photon. And so if you measure the, where the entangled photon is, you know where the original photon is. So it's a bit like checking which slit it went through. When you do that and you put a detect, detector here, then you get rid of the interference fringes. They go away because you know which slit it went through. And it gets even weirder because this is why it's called the eraser, because if you put a third beam splitter, so now the light from here gets reflected and here, some goes down there, some goes straight through, some, so you can't tell now where it came from. That light messes up, it loses the information of which slot it went through. When you do that, even though you haven't done anything here at all, the interference fringes come back. So you haven't manipulated this part, you've only manipulated the copies, but somehow the, inf the fact that you have information about where it is, is an and you lose that information, is enough to get back the interference. And it gets even weirder than that because you can have a delay of when you put this beam splitter in, you can wait till the photon has gone through here. So if it's a single photon, it's already chosen which path it's gonna through, go through. And you can even, and this is really weird, you can wait till it's gone through here, after the photon's here, and then put the beam splitter in. And you still get the same effect. It's like, so if it was some kind of material mechanical operation, you, there's no possibility that you could get that. So the first guy that proposed that was a uh, physicist, John Wheeler. After proposing it, he said, we are participants in bringing, bringing to being not only the near and the here, but the far away and the long ago. We are in this sense participators in bringing about something of the universe in the distant past. And this guy, John Wheeler, he's not some hippie guy. He's a serious physicist. He was the thesis advisor of my thesis advisor. So in science, he's my granddaddy. Um, so 
this experiment was actually done four years ago. They did this experiment with a helium atom, and they got the result that I just talked about. They put the, they put the uh, grating in after the helium atom had gone through the whole apparatus, and it still had the same effect of uh, getting the interference patterns. And the physicist who did it, Andrew Truscott, he said, this proves that measurement is everything. At the quantum level, reality does not exist if you're not looking at it. This is a physicist guy. I hope he's still employed because, you know, physicists usually don't like that kind of thing. For Shantana Sabadini, oh, by the way, his slide, the slides of the quantum Moriser experiment are from his book, which is, has a great explanation of this whole thing. I recommend it. He says, the main teaching we can draw from the quantum Moriser is that there's no actual collapse of the state vector. What is he talking about? Well, luckily, people talked about the state vector. They're talking about superposition. If you have two waves, the red one and the blue one, those are two possibilities of what can happen in an experiment. And the superposition is this dotted green line, which is just a linear, you stick them together. And that's what, um, that's what quantum physics, um, when you do analysis, you get a superposition. Each one of the waves gives you the probability that that thing will happen, but there's nothing that anyone knows which will tell you which thing will actually happen when you observe it. So um, what does it mean to, for Chantain to say there's no collapse of the wave function? Well, um, originally, a proposal to explain um, quantum physics, the first proposal, like he talked about, was uh, the Copenhagen interpretation, where you have an objective collapse. The idea is that the uh, wave function is something real, and then somehow observation, when you observe the situation, there's a real collapse of the wave function. It collapses from all the possibilities into a single actuality. And uh, there was a lot of problems with that. The uh, Schrodinger's cat experiment is an example of um, originally proposed as an objection to this idea that something physically could be collapsed because how can the cat be in a state of alive and dead at the same time? You heard that story already. And <clears throat> this is actually an argument from a, a physicist. He says the same physical state, which is the superposition, it underlies all the different possible outcomes. So there can't be any causal link at all between the superposition and the thing that you actually observe. Um, again, he says, the state of the, the superposition can't be linked to the observations. The, the state of the system at the point of observation, called an eigenstate, the thing you actually observe, can't of course the observation because it doesn't belong to the system prior to the observation. So if you see this flowers here, you can say, oh, the flower, as it is caused my observation of the flower, my perception of the flower is caused by that observation. But in the, the case of quantum physics, the superposition, or the, I can't cause it, the superposition is all the possibilities. The single state that you observe can't cause it because the single state is created, but only appears at the, at the moment of observation. It can't be a causal link. So it kind of, to get around these kind of ideas, there was um, many worlds interpretation, which again, you heard about in the many worlds interpretation, all the possibilities that could happen at any moment actually really do occur. So there's all these possibilities of what can happen and somewhere there's all these alternative universes. Obviously the problem with that is that you replacing one problem with a bunch more, like where are these universes? How do they get produced? What's going on? So that also is problematic. Um, now there's a, quite a few physicists who like this theory called decoherence. Decoherence theory is a way to explain the whole thing without wave function collapse. In decoherence, there isn't any wave function collapse. And this is a really important point. Wave function collapse is apparent that the superposition is still there, no wave function collapse, but it looks like there is. So what's going on here? You get um, decoherence means that you have a rapid decoherence, which means separation of all the elements in the superposition. As soon as you have any contact with, this, with the uh, coherent system with the external world. So it's relying on interactions with the environment and the, and the system that you're studying. So any, any elements that interacts with the environment will be entangled with the environment and then it's impossible for it to be superimposed with all the other possibilities. That was complicated, but basically the idea is that wave function collapse is apparent. To me, it seems a bit like begging the question because it doesn't seem to me there is any actual in elements defined to interact with the system before the observation, but whatever. So which of these theories is actually correct? Like any of them? See what Nizagadata says about it. He says, 
It, by mean of the supreme reality, is the source, the inexhaustible possibility. Possibility is sounding like superposition. Supreme makes everything possible. That's all. That's all it does. Reality, it just makes things possible. It's possibility. And you, in fact, are this infinite possibility, the inexhaustible possibility. So he's pretty clear. He's kind of signing on the facts of what decoherence would say, that reality at the fundamental level is the superposition. It's not, it's not the elements that we believe, that flower. <clears throat> he also says the void, another word for him, for reality, is full to the brim. It's the eternal potential, and consciousness is the eternal actual. So consciousness is related with the actual flower. Before anything can come into being, there must be somebody to whom it comes. So everything is relative to some kind of observer. And the potential becomes actual by thinking. That's what he says quite clearly. The conviction that you are conscious of a world is the world. That's what the world is. It's your conviction that it's there. That's all it is. It's nothing else. And things are as they are because you accept them as they are. Our conviction that things are as they are, our real belief and some kind of psychological inertia, I don't know how to describe it, is what keeps things the same as they are. Heisenberg actually had a proposal. Heisenberg is one of the, Heisenberg's uncertainty, but he was one of the constructors of quantum theory, and he had a, this proposal, potentia interpretation. Potentia qua potentia, because things sound better in Latin. What it means basically, everything is possibility. So he had this idea, he had this res potentia, this world of potentia, where everything was just potential. And he proposed this seriously. But the problem was people said, okay, so where's that come from? Like, what are the constraints? If, if everything is possibility and there's no objects, then what are the things possibilities of? Where does it come from? So it didn't really go very far. However, if you take the idea from, from mysticism that the possibilities come from the perspective that you take when you identify with a body, that gives you a very clear set of possibilities. <clears throat> oh, this is just another point that uh, Schrodinger said to Einstein in 1950, the conception of the world, I'm going the wrong way, okay. The conception of the world that really exists is based on there being a far-reaching common experience of many individuals. In fact, all individuals come into the same state or a similar situation with respect to the object concerned. That's just saying that in 1950, there was already the understanding that the objective world is no more than consensus reality. That was, that was on 70 years ago. So now we'll move on to the brain, and in particular, we're going to look at cortex. That's this big wrinkly part here, um, the bit you see on the outside. And the cortex is responsible for all of our, what people call higher functions, basically our perception, our movement, um, our thoughts. That's, that all happens in the cortex. And when you first look at it, you think, wow, it's really complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on there. There's motor parts, sensory parts, visual parts. So all the visual activity is going on over here, all the sound is processed in here, what's going on? We need some principles of cortical function. Well, how do we take this big mess here, which is, these are all visual areas, all the visual areas start connecting to each other, they go up to a, what do, how can we make sense of it? One principle we can see is that there is a hierarchy. It's immediately apparent, if you look at cortical anatomy, there's a hierarchy. So if you stick electrodes in the brain, in the primary visual cortex, you'll find that when you show lines in front of a cell, it fires. If you show complex things, it doesn't fire. But if you go higher up, more and more, you go up in the hierarchy, the more and more complex is the stimuli that the cells like to respond to. At the top level, inferior temporal cortex, you'll see that cells respond to specific faces. And so it's pretty apparent that the cortex is building up representations from simple lines into more complex shapes, into all the complexity that we have in our visual world. And this also happens in the motor cortex for small movements and also for thoughts in the frontal cortex. Thoughts which are a step beyond sensory experience. So you take all these faces, all these sounds, you combine them together and you get thoughts and those progress to the highest level of conscious awareness that we have. How do, where do the lines come from at the bottom? Well, if you have a bunch of dots, like basically what the retina responds to, your retina has all these dot responses. If you take a bunch of cells that are all in a line in the visual world, then all the dots that they respond to will line up and, and there'll be a line there. And so there are actually cells that take input from all the dot 
don't respond to the, that are in a line, and these cells are the ones that respond to the lines. So you're, you're making up higher, more complex things from uh, abstracting simple things. So any object, such as a line, is actually a set of relationships between other objects. That's the important thing. What you're calling an object is actually just relationships between simpler objects. Okay? This is exactly the same principle that uh, all the deep learning that people are um, talking about now works on exactly the same way. You have simple uh, line responders of units early in the net, and then they become more and more complex and respond to faces and things like that. So our first principle is hierarchy for abstracting features. And that leads to a selection based on memory, kind of a habit. And the important thing here is that once you learn it, any information that you can't match with a feature is ignored you throw it away. You literally, it's not perceivable. You can't perceive it. Because there's information coming in like all dots at different positions, and if they don't line up with your features, you can't see them. So this is a very strong selection principle that of all the possibilities that there are, of all the information, you are selecting a very specific, specific one, specific point. So how does selection happen? Okay, the next thing we're gonna look at is one of these elements that is a line detector, actually it's not just a single cell, it's actually a whole network. Again, so what, how does this network work? First of all, oh my God, it's so complicated. There's six layers, there's all these cells, it's a really complex circuit, what's going on? Well, if you look at this, this is again the same circuit in visual cortex. This is a circuit from uh, frontal cortex of a rat. And you'll see that these things here, they're called motifs. This motif is all of the excitatory cells connecting to each other and to all the inhibitory cells that connect to each other. And this motif here is seen in every cortical area. So the basic elements and structure are common across all modalities and species. Same circuit motifs process, cat vision, human thinking. So all the complex things that we do and all other mammals, rats, mice, and everything, they all use this motif to do it. And it's all based on this abstraction hierarchical method. And so what does this circuit do? What's going on in this circuit? Let's have a little look. If we look at the cells, we see that, okay, we've got all the excitatory cells, they all connect to the inhibitor cells. When an input comes in, one of the excitatory cells will fire, and that will cause uh, connections to other excitatory cells, which aren't included in this figure, but a few of the other excitatory cells will fire. So they'll fire in a big burst, all the ones that are best tuned to this stimulus. Then there'll be a big feedback inhibition and this feedback inhibition will stop all of the other cells from firing. So this is selection method. You select a small group of cells, and you say, which represent some particular part of the world, and you say, all the rest is off, turned off. What does it look like in um, actual brain activity? Well, here's a simulation from, can you see that? Okay. There's a simulation um, of 20,000 cells simulating a millimeter of activity. This is called a heat map. It means that the cells that are black are not responding. The cells that are blue are responding a bit. The ones that are green more. The code, the kind of what they're signaling is carried by the white and the blue and the uh, red cells. They're firing a lot. This is just the inputs. This is with cortical, the cortical circuit turned on. So if you go back and forth, you can see the actual code, the, the kind of pattern in the middle doesn't change. What changes is all of the blue ones, they're cut off, they stop firing. And all of, the, uh, all of the ones in the middle, you go from a kind of a weak pattern, the ones that are firing to some significant amount are actually boosted and fire more. So the cells that are um, firing maximally are kind of boosted. So you've got a kind of opposite direction, boosting and suppressing. What does it look like? You're basically going from something like this, some kind of differences, there are differences here, to something like this where you have an edge, basically a separation. So the cortical circuitry is creating edges, boundaries, absolute differences, like black and white. So another proposal, another uh, principle is you emphasizing differences in order to create boundaries. That's what the cortex is about. You uh, amplify strong correlations, suppress weak correlations. You, you're suppressing subtle things to produce a simple story. At least when you make it, it's simple. Another thing that you get from this kind of process, the cortical circuitry, is good and bad. And where does that come from? From something called the amygdala, which maybe you've heard of. The amygdala is somewhere in here, inside the cortex. The amygdala receives input from every cortical area, except for the primary areas, except for the areas one just lines. Every cortical area inputs into the amygdala. And then the amygdala 
feeds back to the same cortical area, so it creates a big loop. And why is it doing that? Well, if you take a blow up of the amygdala here, there's another input in the, into the amygdala from your kind of feeling centers in, in the neuroscience, the emotional centers, the visceral centers, things that, things that um, are supplying serotonin, dopamine, and those kind of things that are relate, related to how we feel about things. And what happens in the amygdala is you take the you take the feeling input, you take the representational cortical input, and you mush them together, you correlate them, and then you feed that back to the cortex. And so now you have anything that triggers an emotional reaction, which means that it's important for the organism, is tagged. So that when you see the same thing again, or close enough to the same thing, which it will take as the same thing, you have approach avoidance behavior depending on the valence, valence means good or bad, of the feeling. So if something that you see was good last time, you go towards it. If something you see is scary like a lion, and it's, you saw it eat someone, you run away. So you, this is basically the mechanism of, a, of a approach avoidance behavior, which is um, a lot of psychology is based on this. Um, basically desire and fear. This is desire and fear governing our world. So we have another pr principle, controlling behavior and perception based on the memory of how similar situations felt in the past, or even the future, if you kind of imagine about how things might be, you can get afraid and you can desire things in the future. Notice that it's not just behavior, but it's actual perception. You're controlling the things that you think are real based on how you feel about them. <clears throat> and it depends on experiencing the present situation as the same as things that happened in the past which actually is a corollary of just the fact that it's um, a memory. It's all coming from memory. If you combine these three ideas in neuroscience, you get this idea that you, at the top of the hierarchy, you have something which is our highest level conscious experience. It's kind of our attentional focus. This is the thing that we have at the top of our consciousness, controlling our desires, what we want. And this thing has always a discrete idea in it. It's not, it's not possibilities. It's been narrowed down to one particular thing. And this thing has been abstracted from all the multiple possibilities that are coming into the cortex. And it's done, and it, it's been done based on your desires and your fears at the time. And this top level is determined the least by sensory data because sensory data comes at the bottom and it's determined the most by effective feedback, which is neuroscience talk for desire and fear. So your atten what, what stays in here your attentional focus is most determined not by what's happening out here, but by how you feel about it. And yeah, this is the thing that determines our conscious behavior. So what does Nizagar Nizagar say about this? He says, to divide and particularize is the mind's very nature, stuff the cortex is doing. There's no harm in dividing, but separation goes against fact. Trying to make things into a square wave, yes and no, black and white, things and people are different, but they're not separate. Whatever you think about with desire or fear appears before you as real. And it's desire that gives birth, gives name and form. We think these walls are real, but they're not. So what have we learned overall? Well, from physics, we learned that superposition of possibilities is what's real. Wave function collapse only apparent. Many worlds and decoherence are actually compatible. If you think of many worlds as not all these universes existing out there, but they're possibilities. All these, in many worlds, you're talking about possibilities, not real world, not real worlds. There's multiple possibilities of everything that can happen. And decoherence theory is saying that's what's real. It's not incompatible. It's all related to the perspective that we identify with. That's what chooses. It's not a real wave function collapse. It's apparent to us. Everyone has their own universe and they, they overlap according to the degree to which we're the same, which for 99% of things is you know, the real world that we call real. So it's perspective, and the perspective uh, defines space and time. Space and time itself is, comes from us, and us as all creatures, not, not just humans, but that's what's a, it's a way of separating things so that we can deal with them and use this desire-fear mechanism to navigate the world and evolve and live. Um, there's some Nizaka data quotes I don't have time for. Um, from neuroscience, brain constructs hierarchies of correlations by approximating, ignore the circle. Um, we conflate similarities into identity. We say things that are similar are the same, pattern matching, so we can navigate our world based on desire and fear. 
Desire bridges the universe, miraculous powers. You've projected onto yourself a world of your own imagination based on memories and based on desires and fears. And I think my last slide, by itself, the mind can actualize any number of possibilities, but unless they're prompted by love, they're valueless. That's it. Thank you.